So in this video, we are going to talk about incident management in System Center Service Manager, and we're going to talk generally about the incident configuration and the, the sort of design considerations that most customers are going to need to make right. when they design the incident configuration. And then we're going to talk um, more specifically about three different things within the incident configuration. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, We do three small customizations, um, one that's going to make the lives of your analysts a little bit easier in terms of getting data about users. One uh, small change to the way we assign support groups to incidents that saves a lot of time uh, on the administrative end of the system. And one to the way we do classification categories that's going to allow you to get much more rich data out of the system. Great, okay, let's have a look. So this is the default incident form in Service Manager. And if we start in the top left-hand corner, you can see, first of all, we have a colored banner, and we have this in, in all the work items. Um, we have an icon. We get the ID number for the work item. We have the status below it. In the middle of the banner, we have a little bit of info about the affected user, name, contact info. If this incident had a parent, if this were a child to a parent incident, we get a link to that parent there. And then you can see in the right-hand corner, uh, we can see the date and time that the incident was created, and we can see a target end date there, which gets picked up from a service level objective on this particular incident, and we can see the first response date. Now, the timer. We, we get questioned about this timer all the time by customers. Yeah, yeah. Service Manager has functionality that allows you to do some time tracking in the system, and this timer helps with that. What it does is it measures the number of minutes that the incident form has been open. You can click on the timer icon in order to pause the timer, and then I can click it again in order to resume the timer. And what this does for us is it tracks how much time I, as the user logged in, have been working the incident. All of this time will get tallied up once the incident has been resolved and will populate here, and we can see how much time was worked against this incident versus the total time it took from the time it was created until it was resolved. So go back to the general tab here. Okay, so looking at the form itself, we've got uh, what's called a user picker for the affected user. Uh, why don't you talk about where we're getting our user data from? We're not entering it all manually. Right, yeah. Service Manager has a number of connectors that will plug into third-party systems. Where we're getting our users from here is from an Active Directory connector that brings in all of the data about our users as well as groups and computers and printers once a day overnight. So we're pulling up that information, and it's not just the data, not just the name of the user, but also a lot of additional data like what um, organization they're, they're a part of, who their manager is, uh, their contact information like you can see up in the banner. So a lot of the, the basic info that you'd have about the, about the user in Active Directory will just come into Service Manager That's right. once a day. You can also see we've got a title and a description, we've got 256 characters for the title, 4,000 for the description, so you can get quite a lengthy description in there. We also have uh, a drop-down for classification category, and this is configurable. We've got a drop-down for source, which is partially configurable. A number of these values are hard-coded into the system, and then we've added a few ourselves. And then we've got drop-downs for impact and urgency. And if you're not familiar, this is an ITIL concept. Uh, the impact of the incident is the scope or the scale of the incident. The urgency is the speed with which the incident needs to be resolved. And the idea here is that the combination of the two will give us a numeric priority based on something that we configure. Yeah, and you can see, for instance, at an impact of low and an urgency of medium, we have a priority of three. If I raise the urgency of this incident to high, it'll upgrade the priority to two automatically. And we've got how many levels of priority? We've got five levels of priority in the system, and that's about the most that we see in a lot of customer environments. Any more than that really starts to get kind of redundant. You know, what's the difference between a priority five and a priority six? It starts to get um, more than you really need. And we can go up to nine if, if we wanted to. We can go up to nine total. Now, we've got a simple uh, drop-down for support group. Again, this is another fully configurable list. Uh, next to the support group drop-down, we have another user picker for the assigned to user. 
what is the relationship between the support group dropdown and the assigned to user? If I'm, you, you've selected enterprise applications here, am I only going to see people in enterprise applications? No, these lists are independent from each other. So regardless of which support group I have selected for the incident, or if I have no support group assigned at all, I'm going to get the same list of users that I can assign to the incident itself. Now you can scope the assignees on the incident to just folks within IT, so you're not looking at everybody in the organization. But there isn't any relationship between the support group you select and the user you can assign to the incident. And further, Service Manager doesn't really have any concept of your IT organization. We don't set up the groups with users inside of it. It doesn't really allow you to set up who the supervisor for these users are going to be. They're just a simple drop-down list and then a, a, a simple user picker for the assignee. And we have another uh, user picker for something called a primary owner. Again, this is another ITIL concept. If you would want to have end-to-end -end ticket ownership, if, say, you had an incident that was going outside the service desk for diagnosis and resolution, but you wanted to maintain, you wanted somebody on the service desk to maintain visibility into the incident, you could assign them here as a primary owner. And then as this incident went to, say, enterprise applications and, and was worked by an analyst there, uh, I could, as the primary owner, maintain visibility into this incident throughout its life cycle, maybe liaise with Josephine on status and maybe liaise with Nick, the affected user, to keep him up to date. The, the escalated checkbox, this is another thing that is often questioned by customers. So tell us what that box does. Sure, yeah, the escalated checkbox really is just a flag for the incident. It doesn't necessarily drive any workflow out of the box. You can use it to trigger email notifications. You can certainly report off of the property. But by itself, it is just a flag on the incident. We can check that off. Now it's escalated, and, and that's as, as far as it goes, unless we did further configuration. So it's fair to say it means what you want it to mean. Yeah, you can use it the way you, know, you need to use it within your environment. So we, we've got two multi-instance pickers below the drop-downs on the form here. We've got uh, a multi-instance picker for affected services and a multi-instance picker for affected items. Um, affected services uh, are business services. Uh, business services can be created in a couple of different ways in Service Manager, and it's kind of a topic itself, so we won't get too much into it here. We have defined this ERP CRM service ourselves in Service Managers, but we could also import affected services from Operations Manager, where you can export your distributed application groups from SCOM and import them into Service Manager as affected services. The concept is basically it allows us to group together related configuration items into an overall service. You can see here that we've also selected uh, a specific CI that's actually picked up the affected service as an individual CI here. It also knows what CIs are assigned to this affected user. So you are the affected user, Nick, and, and this CI SEA0021 is assigned to you. That's right, yeah, and any of the devices that are assigned to a user will appear in this drop-down list. So this is a laptop, but if I also had a desktop computer and maybe a company-issued phone, we could see those three devices here, and we can select the device that's being affected click Add CI and it'll add our relationship for us um, in, in an easier way than having to, to root through all of the different computers in the environment and pick out the one that we need. And that's being defined in Configuration Manager. That's right, yeah. It can either be defined manually, um, but the best way to do it is to, to have it come from System Center Configuration Manager and then it'll populate automatically. And then finally at the bottom of the form we do have an action log. Uh, we've got a box where we can add comments, and we have the option to mark those comments private. And, and the effect of marking a comment private is to keep it out of the end-user self-service portal. So if we had a comment that we wanted to add that was maybe only relevant to analysts, we could mark it private, and then the end-user would not see that if they went to review the status of this incident in the portal. And you'll see that there are other automated actions that are captured in the action log like the record being signed or the creation of a relationship. The resolution of the record, for example, the re resolution of the incident would also get automatically captured here in the action log.
As a rule, we really like to avoid doing any sort of extensive customization in Service Manager. And it's not just that we don't want to do it. Most of our customers are just not interested in making too many customizations to the application. Um, they are okay with what we would call light customization. And we'll talk about an example of that right now, which is a light customization that Nick has made to this incident form. It's in the upper left-hand corner of the form. You'll notice under my name in the affected user picker, we have the company name, Acceleres. That does not appear by default. Nick, why don't you explain how you put that into the form? Sure. Yeah, there's a using the companion authoring tool, we can add labels to the incident form anywhere we want, really. Um, so what we've done is we've added a label here that shows the company of the affected user. We could add any of the properties of the affected user that we want to. And, and in other applications, we've added um, an indicator about whether the user was a VIP. Um, we can add their contact information. We can do a couple of different things in order to give the analyst some additional information about our user um, to make it easier to troubleshoot their issue. I think another uh, use case we've seen for this is um, just a note about whether a particular user uh, is a user of a specific application or not. And of course, we've got a little bit of room there. You could potentially put more than one property there if you wanted to, right? Absolutely, yeah. And another great one is their location. If you have multiple sites in your company and you need to know which um, site the affected user is at so you can get it routed to somebody who's in the same building as them, that's another great application for adding some details under the affected user. When working with customers on their incident configuration, I think it's fair to say that we spend more time working with them on the right means of classifying incidents than we do on any other part of the configuration. Uh, by default, service manager ships with one classification list, the classification category list. And it's a simple single level list out of the box, and it's got about seven or eight uh, generic values in it. Uh, and, and it's fine, um, although it's, it's usually not quite right for most of our customers. Now, it's a fully configurable list, and, and we've got a couple of different options. Um, we can make it a longer single level list with uh, some or all custom values. We can also make a multi-level list. We can do hierarchical lists in Service Manager, and we can go several levels deep if we really want to. Um, so we might have, say, the name of an application or a system uh, in the top level position, and then in the second level, we might have uh, different components within that system or different parts of that application. And that's a perfectly valid way of setting up classification. What we prefer and what we recommend to most customers is what you're looking at on the screen right now, which is a two-list configuration. We'll use the native classification category list, and we will change the values in that list, typically to values like this, very, very generic values that are indicative of the symptom of the incident. It, it, I think of it as what's wrong. And these are applicable to potentially to just about any type of incident. And then in this custom area list, as we've titled it, we have the names of applications or the names of systems. And we've got, as you can see, a two-level list here. So for example, uh, we've got a parent item of infrastructure, and then we could choose, say, Microsoft SQL Server within that. So this gives us a couple of dimensions of classification. And, and to be clear, again, these are, these are independent lists. So what we choose in the classification list does not drive what's available to us in the area list or, or vice versa. But we feel like this is one of the best options that we have in Service Manager. It's a light customization, and it provides some nice flexibility in terms of reporting. Yeah, that's one of the greatest things about this customization is it really enhances our ability to do reporting and analysis on incidents. What it does is it gives us two dimensions that we can report against incidents in terms of their classification category instead of just one if we're using a single list. One way you can think of it is 
that we can have our classification categories across the top of a matrix and all of our areas going down the left hand side in kind of a cross tabular format so we can see our data in two different ways. Um, you know, another way I like to talk about this is that, you know, I can look at um, connectivity issues that we have across the environment regardless of the uh, application that people are having at, uh, difficulty connecting to. Or we could just look at all of the issues affecting SQL Server regardless of the symptom of that issue or any combination of those two things. So it really enhances the, the kind of data that you can get out of your reports. And I think it really assists with the kind of trending that you can do over time to see where you might have problems in your environment. So l let's talk about the effect of adding a custom list on the data warehouse. Yes, yeah, in a lot of ways, Service Manager automates the data warehouse for you. And many kinds of customizations that you do will automatically get brought over into the data warehouse, but list values are an exception to that. When we extend Service Manager by adding a new list property, we have to do an extension to the data warehouse um, in addition to that to make sure that we get those values across. And what we have to do here is create what's called an outrigger in the data warehouse. We won't cover uh, the process for building an outrigger in this video, but we'll leave a link in the description for a Microsoft blog article that Chris Lauren wrote a few years ago that, that explains that process. It's a simple piece of XML that you would build in a management pack. You import it into the Service Manager console and it will allow you to report on those properties in the uh, data warehouse databases. It's also worth mentioning that custom list properties are not going to appear in the Service Manager 2012 Analysis Services cubes. Um, those also would need to be extended or new cubes would need to be built in order to report off of custom list properties. One customization that we've been making regularly for a while now is we've been removing the default support group list from the incident and have been replacing it with this single instance picker. Um, just to confirm, natively, support group is, is just a list and all you're doing is picking a list value. And uh, it makes it very simple, but it generates a bit of extra work when it comes to creating other objects in Service Manager, uh, creating specifically views and email notifications. If you want to have views for different support groups and email notifications for different support groups, as most of our customers do, then we've got to make sets of views and sets of notifications for each support group. And it, it gets kind of labor intensive. So, as I said, what we've begun doing is replacing that list with this single instance picker. Nick, why don't you explain what's behind this? Sure. Yeah, like, like Pete said, what we're coming from is just a simple drop-down list. And this is going to work sort of similarly from an analyst's point of view. What we've done is we've added a new class called support group. And we can add new support groups or modify existing ones in the configuration items workspace, right, where we would be able to, to manage our users. And we can create these support groups and then we're able to select them and assign to them just like you would any other relationship picker in the system, just similar to, to assigning a user to an incident. And what this allows us to do is to save a lot of effort on the administrative side like Pete said when it comes to things like creating views or email notifications or user roles. Um, this support group value is uh, tied to an Active Directory group. It shares a SID with the Active Directory group and it's got an email address associated with it and it has all of the same members of the Active Directory group it's tied to. And so when it comes to things like configuring email notifications, it's much easier to just look up the group that's assigned to the incident and send the email to that group's email address instead of having to have logic built in that says if support group equals X, email this distribution list, if support group equals Y, email that distribution list. So from an administrative point of view, it's much more simplified in order to set up those kinds of things. And, and actually another advantage of that is that, and we do this a lot, we have test or dev environments and production environments for most of our customers. And because we're emailing a relationship, 
like we would for, say, the affected user or the assigned to user, then uh, it makes testing a lot easier because we can use different uh, email addresses for the support groups in the test environment than the, the production groups. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And I'm going to switch back to the console here, and we can take a look at the views that we have configured. Um, one of the other um, outcomes of using the standard support group list is that we need, if we want to have a set of views for each support group, to configure those views uh, individually for each support group. So we would have to have a set of views for the service desk and another set of identical views for desktop support and so on for all of the groups that you have in your environment. When we use this relationship, it means that we can just have one set of views for the entire system, and then based on which Active Directory group your account is a member of when you log in, you'll just see the stuff that's, that's assigned to you. Um, this also means that we only need one user role for all support groups. Instead of saying the service desk user roles only see the service desk views and the desktop support user roles only see the desktop support views, because it's all just one set of views, it's just one user role for everybody. Um, and so again, you know, from an end user point of view, it's probably not going to make a big difference because they're still just going to see the stuff that relates to them. But from an administrator point of view, for maintaining the system, this makes a huge difference because um, it really simplifies the administrative effort. And, and the only thing that we don't get around with this is uh, there's still no relationship between the support group and the assigned to user. That's right. Yeah, there is not. While the support group is aware of which users are a member, there's no restriction like if it's assigned to the service desk support group, you can only assign it to users that are within that active directory group. You can still assign it to whatever support group you want and whatever um, assigned to user you want. They're independent fields. Thank you very much for watching our video, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Yeah, you can email us directly at info at .com. You can go to our website at www.accelerus.com. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get a notification the next time one of our videos in the series comes out. Thanks. Thank you.